My name is Ernie Humphrey. I'm the Vice President of Educational Programs for Performative, online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. First, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar, The Dragon's Tale, China's Rebalancing, Renminbi Risk and Opportunity. The Chinese economy has breathed fire into commodity prices and emerging markets for much of the last decade, sending many exchange rates soaring upwards. But now, the dragon's tail is whipping through the markets as the economy decelerates, driving prices downward and creating a new surge in volatility. Our webinar today features Carl Shimada, Senior Market Strategist with Western Union Business Solutions. Carl will discuss the often misunderstood aspects of China's impact on the global economy and some of the long-term implications, with a particular focus on the opportunities that are being created as the renminbi evolves into a global trading currency. He will provide insight into the fundamental realignments that are occurring within China and in the West, West understanding of it. First of all, I would like to thank Western Union Business Solutions, whose commitment to thought leadership helps us make this event possible and delivered at no cost, like everything at Performative. A quick note on today's agenda. First, we'll hear a presentation from our speaker, featured speaker, Carl Schmada, and then we'll move into our interactive Q&A session, where we will spend the remainder of our hour. We would like this to be an interactive experience for you. So if you have any questions at any time, please go to the questions area in your GoToWebinar control panel and send us your questions. We can't promise to get to all of them, but we will do our best and we'll follow up afterwards on any questions we did not get to. A few logistical notes about the webinar. A link to today's presentation and webinar of this video will be out to all attendees within 24 hours of the event and will be posted on performative.com for free download. Those who would like CPE credits through NASBA will need to answer all the polling questions during the event and should have pre-registered for CPE credit on the way into registering for the webinar. For any CPE credits, please contact Tanya Walsh at twalsh at performative.com. We'll have Tanya's contact information up again on the final slide. You will be asked to take a short survey today regarding the webinar. Right after the webinar is over, we greatly appreciate your feedback regarding our event today as we always strive to improve the ROI we offer our event attendees for their valuable time. A quick word about performative. Performative is the largest and fastest growing online community and resource for senior level corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related leaders. Performative connects corporate finance leaders to provide instant advice and insights on the tough financial and strategic challenges they face every day. Okay, let's get started by introducing today's first speaker, Carl Schmada, Senior Market Strategist, Western Union Business Solutions. Carl has designed and implemented risk management and trading solutions for hundreds of companies ranging from small businesses to large corporations. As a member of the Business Solutions Analytical Team, Carl also provides market analysis and strategic guidance on a daily basis for thousands of international businesses. Carl is a regular contributor to a number of international treasury and finance magazines, and his market analysis and forecast have appeared in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg Business Week, Reuters, CNN, and CNBC. Carl is the president of the Association of Corporate Financial Professionals, Canada, Calgary, and also serves on the advisory board for risk, AFP's new newsletter on corporate risk management, and Carl is a frequent speaker um, at performative events. With that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Carl Shimada. Carl, take it away. Thank you very much for that kind of direction, Ernie. Um, you're getting better at that every time. <laughs> um, Absolutely. It's great to join the performative audience again. Um, you know, we've spoken a number of times over the last uh, year and a half, and, uh, and you know, I believe we spoke about six months ago. Um, since then, a lot of water has flowed under the bridge. Um, very much in line with our expectations, we've seen a sharp shift in sentiment on the euro area itself uh, as the likelihood of, of collapse has actually receded. Um, at the same time, we've seen a growing sense that the developed world will continue to muddle through uh, the problems that it's facing without experiencing major shocks. Um, volatility levels are relatively low right now, uh, despite the fact, uh, or despite a growing belief that the central banks cannot continue to support economies in the long run. Um, but uh, you know, and, and you know, we're feeling fairly calm out there. Um, but the fact is that traders actually suffer from a a form of uh, attention deficit disorder, we might call it. <laughs> um, they're continually on the lookout for a new crisis, a new source of volatility, um, or, you know, less charitably, a new kind of entertainment. Conveniently, China is providing this right now, and this is very much along the lines of what uh, we've been talking about for the last year and a half or so. Uh, after breathing fire into everything from commodity prices to luxury goods uh, demand over the last decade, 
the Chinese economic dragon now appears to be changing direction, um, and its tail is now lo knocking asset values sideways. Um, and this is causing turmoil across the entire global economy. Now, and I, I have to kind of make a personal note here that this is somewhat gratifying in a sense, because I spent many years uh, very lonely, uh, wandering in the wilderness as something of a, a China bear, um, and I'm now being joined by the vast majority of market watchers. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot more caution and concern about what's happening in China. Um, and, you know, I, I have to say here that I'm not really a China bear. I've often been very cautious about things in China, not because they're uh, really terrible in the grand uh, scheme of things, but really because Western perceptions have so often been completely re real, unrealistic. Um, we've had very, very, uh, a very limited understanding of what's happening in China and also uh, greater hopes than uh, was necessarily uh, realistic to have. Um, so we're now seeing a change, and this shift in sentiment has profound implications for the, for the future of the global economy itself. Um, so today I'm going to start off by providing a broad overview of the historical forces uh, behind what is happening in, uh, in today's business pages. Um, so today, uh, you know, I'll start off by talking about the historical for forces, um, you know, from ancient times through to the two major phase transitions or new equilibria, if you will, uh, that China has gone through over the last 40 years. And then we'll discuss the impact that today's changes might have on the financial markets, in particular, the opportunities that I, I believe are being created as China evolves. Um, but before we get to any of that, I'd like to talk about why this is actually so important. Um, I've watched China for many, many years, and I've always been struck, not just by the fact that the West doesn't understand China, but by the fact that it often just doesn't want to. Uh, time and time again, Westerners have been content to imagine that China is a mysterious, unknowable, uh, alien place. And this has really meant that we have often suspended our sense of disbelief. Um, and this goes back millennia. It, it, it really imposes real cost, both on, West, on the West and on China itself. Um, for example, 3,000 years before the Common Era, China learned how to cultivate silk. For the following 3,500 years, the West was largely content to imagine that it was produced via magical processes <laughs> unknowable by mere mortals. Um, even in Roman times, they believed that silk grew on trees. Um, and this meant that we paid exorbitant amounts to transport the cloth across the planet um, through some of the world's most dangerous territories. Uh, wars were fought over the material, um, and, and you know, the emergence of Victoria's Secret was set back for an incredibly long time. <laughs> um, but, you know, the next thing that the Chinese invented, uh, something very, very major, was paper making. This time around, we'd gotten smarter. Um, it only took us about 1,120 years to learn the trick. Um, and, you know, when you put this into perspective, you have to think about all the novels and other masterpieces that we'd have if we had developed a stronger understanding of China at the time. Um, you know, and, and if we've been able to share knowledge more efficiently 2,000 years ago, how much farther the human race would be ahead today? Um, now, that's enough about the West. When China was first unified, roughly 200 years before Common Era, the country generated an estimated quarter of all economic activity on Earth, um, and it largely maintained this for the next 18 centuries. When the Qing Emperor took the, the throne in 1644, he controlled roughly 22% of the world's GDP. Um, but gradually, step by step, China began to close itself off from the outside world. Uh, barriers to trade were raised, the merchant class was persecuted, and economic rules and regulations multiplied by the day and by the year. Um, ultimately, this meant that the flow of new ideas into the country was gradually cut off. As a result, by the time the Qing Dynasty began to collapse in the late 19th century, the country's share of global GDP had fallen to less than 11%, and it only got worse. After Mao seized power in the late 40s, he launched the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution and further isolated the country. Um, and this utterly destroyed what was left of the Chinese economy. Um, by the 70s, China generated less than 4% of global GDP, and it was one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, to the extent that, that tens of millions of people were dying of, of hunger and famine. So after his death, a new generation of leaders took power, um, and they understood that a clear pattern had emerged. Whenever China isolated itself and tried to impose too many economic rules on its own citizens, it paid a terribly high price. They knew that China needed to abandon its strict adherence to dogmatic economic principles 
in order to regain its place as one of the world's most powerful countries. As Deng Xiaoping put it, it doesn't matter if the, black, the cat is black or white as long as he catches mice. Um, what did he mean here? He meant that he intended to put into place a set of policies that we've now come to know as capitalism with Chinese characteristics. In essence, the government sought to achieve collective strategic objectives by harnessing the power and the, and the motivation of individual citizens um, to get individual citizens working toward a, a, a set of strategic goals. So rather than simply telling people that they needed to work toward these common goals, as they did during the communist era, they used a number of incredibly sophisticated macroeconomic tools to engineer the economy itself. Um, and indeed, if you, if you really need to understand modern China, um, always remember that the vast majority of Central Standing Committee members or Politburo members have been engineers by training uh, really since the, the great reforms began in the 70s. Um, and this really, really tells you how the Chinese policymaking elite actually uh, makes its decisions. These engineers structured the economy so that it would continually, subtly shift household income into strategic investment. How did they do this? They locked up the financial system first, firstly. They took control of all linkages with the outside world and only allowed citizens to deposit their savings within the official banking system. They then mandated that the banks channel these savings into strategically important investments rather than into things like consumer lending. Um, at the same time, they created a number of enormous businesses that were directly controlled by the state, allowing the government to set prices across China, meaning, for example, that electricity could be sold at a premium to households while being sold below cost to steel mills. These state-owned enterprises also gained from direct subsidies and preferential lending, meaning that they could invest in huge infrastructure projects without being overly concerned about whether they would actually break even in the long run. Um, beyond this, interest rates were held level, at levels well below those seen in other growing economies. Um, you know, and I often look at, at uh, the BRIC group of nations, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Um, last year, Brazil's interest rate was the fourth highest in the world. Russia's was the 47th, and China's, or in India, sorry, was the 81st, and China's was the 164th, one of the lowest interest rates in the world. Um, and if, in effect, what this means is that China was subsidizing business borrowing while it punished ordinary citizens who kept their savings within that official banking system. Um, and as we also know, the value of the Chinese yuan was kept way below in, uh, market levels in the rest of the world. Now, the reality here is that, you know, in the West, we've tended to focus on the effect that this had on exports. It helped to make Chinese goods more or artificially cost-effective in the rest of the world. However, it also had an impact on Chinese citizens. It made imports from other countries more expensive, meaning that they were less likely to consume them. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, this entire structure meant that there were clear incentives at all levels of the Chinese economy to invest in infrastructure like factories, mines, and railroads rather than to consume goods. And this was incredibly successful. China deployed almost 46% of its GDP into fixed investment last year, which is not just the highest in the world right now, but it's the highest in recorded economic history to my knowledge. Even the Soviet Union in its heyday was unable to achieve something like this. Um, it's as if the United States were to somehow convince its citizens to quit buying flat screen televisions and iPhones and instead put 50% of their income into building new production facilities and to do this for years and years on end. Um, needless to say, the results have been absolutely spectacular. Um, China grew at an average 9.8% rate for more than three decades, uh, becoming the world's second largest economy almost overnight and lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the process. Um, and really, when we look at this uh, you know, in the big picture, this was an economic miracle on a scale never seen before. Um, and I believe the architects behind it should be given history's deepest respect. Uh, Nobel Prizes have been given out for far smaller accomplishments. Um, however, as Stein's law states, what cannot go on forever won't. China's growth model is now running into limits. The, the economy is really facing at least four major challenges. The first is its vulnerability to the global, global business cycle. With almost 40% of GDP generated through exports, the Chinese government is, is forced to step in with a massive and costly stimulus program whenever conditions deteriorate elsewhere. And it's becoming increasingly difficult for the country to manage this smoothly. 
Okay, so we're now on a polling question. I believe that we need to uh, pause here for a moment. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Carl, for, for, for setting the stage um, for us. Um, what we'd like to do is now is uh, launch our first um, polling question. We would love to have everyone answer that first po polling question. For everyone in the audience, after CPE credit uh, for the webinar, you will have to answer all of the polling question. I think this may give us some good context as far as the audience appetite and what they see as their company's plans to go in uh, to China over the next 12 months. We'll go ahead and leave the polling question up uh, for another uh, 30 seconds uh, or so. I think it's going to be fascinating now that Carl has given us uh, that, that great background um, into the markets, um, what companies will see as the opportunities and challenges to leverage, uh, leverage the markets for their businesses. So we'll go ahead and leave this up for another 20 seconds or so, and then we'll uh, get back to Carl's presentation. And then we'll go ahead and have a few more um, polling questions. Um, again, those of you in the audience after CPE credits uh, will need to answer those polling questions. And we will also make the results of the polling questions available on performative.com. Uh, so let's just go ahead and uh, close the polling question now, and then we'll hand, it, and then hand the floor back over to Carl for us. Thanks, Carl. For sure. Uh, sorry about that uh, pause there. Um, so, um, as mentioned, uh, we've had we have some extreme vulnerabilities to the business cycle in the rest of the world. Um, now, there are solutions to this. Uh, China can create or take steps to create a domestic market that might act as a counterbalance to the global one in the future. Um, to do this, workers must receive a greater share of the national income. Wages must rise. Uh, that's the primary first uh, step here. Uh, but they also must feel more reassured about things like health care and retirement if they are to, uh, to drop their precautionary savings rates and begin to spend money in the, in the short term. Um, and at the same time, the taxation system must be adjusted so that the burden falls on income and investment as much as, if not more than, uh, on consumption. Right now, the tax system is strongly geared toward uh, tax and consumption and is very, very low when it comes to income and, and capital gains over time. Uh, the second major challenge that China faces is, is demographic. China is a country that is aging at an incredible rate, uh, largely due to the one-child policy that we're all familiar with that was instituted many decades ago. Uh, China's working age population is actually beginning, expected to begin dropping around 2020, as this chart illustrates. This is a competitive problem. Um, it doesn't seem like it, but when you compare it with India, as we, uh, as we can see on this slide, you can see that India's working age population will continue to grow, so that it is larger than China's by 2025, and it will get larger after that, meaning that it will likely have a cost advantage for some time to come. Now again, there are solutions. Um, the key thing here to think about is that, the, that uh, productivity will, uh, will help to pull China out of this problem. If Chinese workers can produce more, the, the country will retain its competitiveness. To build producti productivity, uh, the existing HOKO system of worker registration must be reformed so that workers are able to move freely and efficiently across the country. Policies must be enacted that steer new business of investment away from the traditional coastal areas uh, toward the interior, where labor costs still remain very, very low and where raw materials prices are often lower as well. Um, and innovation can be stimulated by ensuring that the development of new technologies is properly protected and therefore effectively rewarded. In other words, China must create a robust intellectual property framework. Um, and I think this is really, really crucial because this is what really lay the ground for the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom and for the eventual transition from a copycat culture in the United States to a center of global innovation. Um, it is now becoming a necessity for China as well. Um, and the next major challenge involves the unidirectionality of the uh, Chinese financial system. By that, I mean that much, for much of the last four decades, money has been able to flow into China, but has not been able to flow back out. In essence, the financial equivalent of a one-way valve has been in place for many years. Growing exports grew in larger shares of income, and the People's Bank of China uh, continually had to print money in order to uh, balance the, uh, the currency intervention efforts that it was uh, performing to keep the red minh below. Um, to illustrate that, uh, in 1998, Chinese broad money supply totaled 10 trillion won. By 2005, we were looking at 28 trillion won. And earlier this year, it had reached 85. Um, so that's a st substantial increase. Uh, 
815% in the space of 12 years. In other words, money supply was growing much more rapidly than the underlying economy. Um, and this meant that too much money uh, was sloshing around within the uh, country's financial markets, driving up inflation and creating the conditions for asset price bubbles. Now, conveniently, again, there is a solution to let some of the air out of the balloon. Um, by removing capital controls, the government can allow Chinese citizens and Western companies to move funds back out of the country when the pressure grows too high. If the exchange rate were to be normalized and the renminbi were permitted to flow back and forth across China's borders, a natural balancing mechanism would be in place to allow the system to achieve equilibrium on an incremental basis. But the fourth challenge here is by far the most significant. Um, and I would say here that the feedback loop in the Chinese economy is unquestionably broken. This means that investments are rarely made with a realistic assessment of their macroeconomic costs and rewards. Um, and, you know, I could put up some flawed charts or I could tell you about some of the areas where the problems are cropping up. Um, to start off with, steel. In recent years, we've seen situations where Chinese steel mills were producing steel well below cost and they were flooding global markets with cheap products. Um, the central government repeatedly asked plants to, to close, uh, but to no avail. They kept operating, uh, largely being propped up by local bureaucrats with handouts. Um, eventually, the government had to re resort to sending out demolition teams that went into the provinces to literally blow up the offending mills. This is not something that has to happen in a, in a healthy economy. Um, in a healthy economy, a loss-making enterprise would close eventually. Um, stock markets. In recent months, regulators have begun, begun to crack down on issuers that never disclosed what type of business they were in, never filed financial records, and didn't name their primary shareholders, but were still attracting investment capital. Why was this happening? Simply by being listed, they were able to attract money from Chinese citizens who believe that stock markets exist to rise in value over time. Um, there just isn't a lot of institutional memory of how these things work. Um, Caterpillar fungus. Uh, last year, caterpillar fungus rose in value by more than 1,800%. Um, it has long been regarded as a natural aphrodisiac, but citizens that were looking for a portfolio boost instead began betting on it. Um, so by weight, it is now more valuable than gold. Um, and you know, when it, its valuation eventually wilts, I'm guessing a lot of people are going to be very disappointed. Uh, copper prices, uh, they've begun to climb down from the heights that they reached last year globally, uh, but the metal has long been considered an investment vehicle in China, immune to the normal forces of supply and demand. Uh, at one point it was estimated that more than half of global copper inventory was sitting in Chinese warehouses and was frequently being used as collateral for bank loans, despite the fact that the price is notoriously volatile. Pork farmers have given up raising animals uh, to speculate on hard metals instead, and this is extremely dangerous. Um, and real estate, uh, we've all we've all doubtless heard about this, but you know, back in 2009, a typical Beijing apartment cost more than 111 times the average worker's salary, and prices have actually risen since then by more than 10 percent a year, despite the government's efforts to cool the market down. According to numbers published by the Beijing Municipal Public Security Bureau uh, in August there are 3.8 million vacant homes in the city alone. This is a huge, huge number and, and you know, utterly unparalleled in the West. Um, you have entire cities full of empty buildings that have been built uh, with local gover governments borrowing vast amounts of money to build airports, rail lines, and highways that sit largely unused as there's no underlying fundamental demand for them. Um, you know, and, and really the big picture here is if this reminds you of Japan in the early 80s, it should. Uh, there's clear signs of inefficiency uh, happening within the Chinese economy. So the key here is that if China were to remove artificial factors from the economic feed feedback loop, many of these excesses would correct themselves on their own. By making banks responsible for their loan portfolios, by removing political influence over lending decisions, and by allowing the market to set interest rates, risks would be priced more accurately. And this would mean that local governments would find themselves unable to fund massive public works projects with little conceivable gain, and speculators would have a very difficult time borrowing money to gamble with. Um, and perhaps more importantly, if business cycles were permitted to play out with minimal government intervention, problems would not be given the room to grow over a span of decades. It's like forest fires. Um, 
Frequent small ones are much less damaging than infrequent large ones. Firefighters know this and most economists know this, but policymakers in China and, and in the West um, often miss it in their misguided efforts to build strong track records. So in essence, what we're looking at here is China needs to transition from a trickle-down system where decisions are made at the top toward a trickle-up structure in which economic decisions are made by businesses and individuals at the lowest levels. This should make the country more efficient, but also more flexible in the face of changing global conditions. At the same time, a greater share of income must wind up in the pockets of individual households as opposed to large-scale business in interests. Um, and you know, at, at this uh, interval, I'd like to say that I know that all of this sounds like a Western observer's opinion, but China's policymakers are fully aware of the challenges. As a matter of fact, I'd suggest that they're more aware than Westerners are. Um, when Zhou Bao said last year, we are keenly aware that we, have, we still have a serious problem in that our development is not yet, yet well balanced, coordinated, or sustainable. He and other leaders have repeatedly stated that they want to guide the economy in a new direction. The last two five-year plans have laid out reform measures aimed at fixing these problems, but they are facing challenges. Um, from a macro perspective, global trade levels are falling, and this is putting the Chinese economy under stress. And at the same time, the government itself is preparing for a generational transition in November. Um, so we're seeing reforms move uh, forward at a very halting pace. Um, and I, I like to uh, think about this as uh, an accepted rule in China's politics. Uh, two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward to move the country in the right direction, and then one step back to placate existing stakeholders. Um, but in the big picture, we are seeing clear signs that the country is moving forward. Um, here are average wages uh, across China between 2002 and 2012. As you can see, we've seen a very rapid increase, more than 15% a year on average, amounting to a substantial gain in household incomes, even when set against deflation, inflation. We've also seen a phenomenal increase in pension coverage in recent years. It started with uh, urban residents being covered, but is now being expanded to rural areas as well. Um, almost half a billion people were added to the national pension system in the last two years alone. It's truly unbelievable in scale. Um, and we're also seeing huge improvements in China's protection of intellectual property. In 2010, several patent reforms came into play, making uh, China's system arguably superior to the to that of the United States in many ways. Um, and you know, in specific here, Chinese law requires that patents be put into use within a reasonable period. Um, and this means that patent trolls are unable to sit on ideas and stifle innovation, um, as, we're, uh, as we're seeing often recently. Um, as this chart illustrates, this has been incredibly successful. We've seen the number of pat patents uh, registered in China take off at an incredible rate. Innovation still remains relatively low, uh, copying remains rampant, but the country is making a clear effort to protect ideas and therefore encourage the creation of more ideas in the future. And interest rates have also begun to rise. Um, although there have been several decreases in official benchmark rates in recent months, the real cost of funding has risen well above historical norms. Um, and this is bringing China into closer alignment with other economies that are growing at a similar pace. At the same time, the renminbi is rising. Um, it's risen fairly steadily since 2009, and this is making exports less competitive and imports more competitive. Um, now, you know, all of this uh, sounds, sounds like shadow dancing in a sense. We're looking at the shadows on the screen. However, uh, it is having an, Im an impact, and you can see it here. Last year, China made a large contribution to uh, global consumption growth, larger than any other country, um, and the increase is expected to be larger in the coming year. Now, of course, this is having an impact on the country's external position. As imports rise faster than exports, the current account surplus is shrinking. Uh, now, what does this mean? It means that China is able to put less money into fixed investment over time. And this, in turn, implies that the overall growth rate is beginning to slow and that long-term performance is likely to drop. Um, and you know, here I brought in the World Bank's uh, expectations here. So the World Bank has plotted historical growth rates along with its forecast over the next 20 years. Um, and as you can see, we've seen a remarkably steady transition toward lower growth over time. Um, I would personally suggest that their forecast may be a little overly optimistic. Um, I'd expect more volatility in the years ahead, uh, combined with an overall trend rate closer to the 5% mark. 
Um, but regardless, what we're seeing here is that China is making solid progress toward becoming a country just like any other, with fundamentals just like any other. Uh, the question is what this means for global financial markets. Um, and, and really this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning here, that often when we're speaking about China, it isn't the realities that matter as much as the perceptions of, of reality. Um, in other words, the financial markets can have uh, an outsized uh, reaction to events within China. And I would suggest here that the primary impact that we will see within the uh, financial markets will rip out, ripple out from the uh, hard commodities complex. Because of the strict capital controls that have been in place over more than, uh, more than the last two decades, it's really been only one viable way to make a large bet on China's growth. And that was to buy the energy products, the metals, the raw industrial materials that all of this new Chinese infrastructure would require. Um, as you can see, Western investors have made this bet on a colossal scale. Uh, many commodity prices are way above historical highs, even after a sharp post-crisis correction. This is also supported by the fact that interest rates in the West are at all-time lows. They've been driven to rock bottom by central banks in an effort to stimulate growth. So we've got a situation where investors have been pushed out against uh, out along the risk spectrum and into alternative investments, causing them to move assets out of the funding currencies in the United States and Japan and in Europe into commodity pr producing areas of the world. Um, as you can see, we've seen uh, the euro and the dollar fall precipitously uh, since the financial crisis in 2008, while the Aussie, the Kiwi, and the Canadian dollar have all risen stratospherically. Um, now, if I am correct, and China is indeed rebalancing and its appetites are changing, there will be lower marginal growth and its need for raw materials, and supply will quickly begin to outpace demand. Um, and if the country's citizens begin to sell their inventories, the effect may be even more pronounced. So these currencies may be exposed to weakness in the, in the uh, coming months and years ahead. But these countries are actually only the most obvious ones. Here's a list of larger countries that derive a significant proportion of their export revenues from commodities. But the reality is that the vast majority of the world's smaller economies are those that are most highly dependent on exports of raw materials. Um, you know, everything from Zimbabwe to Peru, um, these countries are heavily exposed to the rise in commodity prices that we've seen. So this in turn puts the entire emerging markets growth story at risk. And I think this chart here uh, clarifies the situ situation rather well. Despite many, many, many crashes uh, through the 20th century, I think I've counted more than 150 emerging market cr crashes during the 20th century, we changed our minds in the early parts of the last decade. Um, and why did we do this? Because China was lifting growth across much of the emerging world. Um, so we've seen a spectacular rise in investment flows into the emerging markets as investors have res responded to a rise in China-supported growth. Now, if history is any indication, much of this money is relatively fickle and will tend to flow out at the first sign of trouble. Um, and there's an old saying here that applies today, I think, uh, and that is that emerging markets are difficult to emerge from in an emergency. Um, so the key here is to be cautious in currencies that have tended to serve as China proxies, those that are commodity-linked, those that are heavily dependent on exports to China, and those that are simply correlated to risk sentiment. Um, if the world changes its mind about what's happening in China and sentiment uh, deteriorates, you could see a sell-off in many of these currencies. Uh, but there is actually a silver lining hidden in this particular cloud. Uh, while China's appetite for hard commodities may fall as the economy restructures away from fixed investment, the rebalancing process itself may actually increase the appetites of Chinese citizens themselves um, for food. <laughs> um, this chart shows daily caloric intake across a number of countries from 1962 to 2011. As you can see, Chinese citizens surpassed India back in the 80s, and they're now eating more than their Japanese counterparts. Um, I, you know, just a personal note here, but I suspect that that's because they have more KFC outlets in China. Um, Japan has an extremely healthy set of appetites. Um, however, uh, the Chinese have not nearly caught up to Europe and the United States, and urbanization is continuing to pull workers away from the countryside. So as income, incomes grow across China and domestic production gains slow, we could see pressure continuing to rise on the soft commodity side of the, of the commodity complex. Uh, more importantly, Global investors are looking for a new place to put all of the money that has just been unleashed by the major central banks. 
Uh, we saw the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, and the Federal Reserve all open the tops in the last month and a half. Um, so in such an environment, the soft commodity complex looks like an attractive outlet. So we need to prepare for more volatility in agricultural markets and potentially for more political st instability in countries that are exposed to rising prices. Um, and you know this, this really goes back to what we saw during the Arab Spring uh, two years ago. This was a, a set of conditions, or this was a, a situation in which prices had risen very, very quickly for basic household inputs. Um, and this created instability in a number of countries across the, the uh, planet, uh, but particularly within the Middle East. Um, and you know, I think I think this is something that we definitely need to have our on our radar going ahead. Um, but you know, all of this brings me to the next key opportunity. As cost differentials narrow between the United States and other areas of the global economy, more businesses are choosing to situate their primary operations closer to their larger markets, um, and reshoring is beginning to happen. Among the major economies, and even against many of the smaller ones, the United States stands out as one of the most flexible and adaptive. Uh, granted, during the financial crisis itself, a lot of damage was, was caused, um, but the economy is retooling. And we're continuing to see sharp rises in productivity here in the United States as businesses lean out and apply advanced technological processes to older business models. Um, and just as an aside here, we will be holding a webinar in January to discuss this. Um, I believe that technological change is, is the one big variable that is currently being ignored in the conventional view of the American economy and really in the conventional view of the uh, entire global economy. Um, I think it will create opportunities on a whole new scale um, as, we, as we see innovation move ahead in the, in the coming years. But the financial bottom line here is that we may begin to see some of the capital that had previously fled U.S. Shore, shores returning, and in, it'll influence uh, exchange rates as it does. And that really brings me to uh, maybe sorry, uh, that really brings me to the polling question here. Uh, Ernie, maybe I'll hand it back over to you there. Sure. Um, thanks very much, <laughs> Carl. So we're going to um, launch um, our last two polling questions here, uh, kind of a back to back, and uh, we are um, thrilled. Um, with Carl's great discussion of, of, of the fundamentals and, and, and what's driving uh, the dragon's tail and those that could be hit by the tail. Um, we're going to ask a few polling questions uh, a little bit more um, focused on actually conducting business in China and then some of the challenges that people often face in doing uh, business in China. So our first polling question um, is related to um, making payments uh, in China and whether or not those are done uh, in renminbi and U.S. dollar. And then the, the question, the follow-up question will be regarding um, the currency exposure to the renminbi. So as, as companies uh, do business in China, um, they will be faced with that trans transaction and translation um, risk uh, in, in any expansions um, in the Chinese market. And hopefully these results will offer us um, some insights in our Q&A um, as we bring the conversation full circle um, to really get down to hopefully a few points of what this really means um, for businesses. So does the dragon's tail take away from those opportunities in China, or as Carl mentioned, um, uh, what, what are some of the other um, ancillary uh, countries, not ancillary, but emerging market countries where, where things that are going on in China can affect those opportunities in those emerging markets, and then maybe offer some insights to the companies uh, on the webinar as far as fundamentals that they can watch um, to see um, what might impact those uh, specific uh, opportunities uh, in these countries. Uh, once again, um, those of you on for CPE credits, please answer on um, both uh, of the polling questions, and we'll give this one another uh, 20 seconds or so, and then we will um, hand the floor back over to Carl to uh, finish up his great um, commentary. And then the remainder of our time, once Carl gets complete, we will go into, into our Q&A um, session. And as I mentioned before, um, I think Carl will see, we'll all put our practitioner's hats on and try and put a point to some of the great um, comments that Carl's made in the fundamentals and say, okay, given all this information, what are the things uh, that we need to watch? And maybe what are the, some of the political signs that we need to watch? And what, what the potential impact that might have um, on that dragon's tail um, as, as it continues uh, to whip back and forth and affect uh, the global market? So uh, let's go ahead and uh, close that second poll and give the floor back over to Carl once we get that slide up. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Ernie. Um, right, so that actually segues very nicely into uh, our next uh, our next big opportunity, and I think that is the internationalization of the renminbi. 
Um, we're talking about a currency that is rapidly becoming one of the world's most important trading currencies. Um, and this is really driven by three major developments that have occurred over the last five years. Um, firstly, from a small start in 2009, the renminbi's international usage has expanded very rapidly. In 2009, we saw a pilot scheme uh, commencing that allowed a limited number of enterprises to send funds uh, to other parts of the world and to receive funds from other parts of the world. Uh, in 2010, we saw the, that number expanded from 365 to 67,359 across, uh, across China. Uh, by 2011, the entire country was uh, permitted to receive renminbi, um, and uh, this was still limited, however, to approved enterprises. By 2012, the entire country, all enterprises in China, were permitted to receive uh, renminbi from anywhere in the world. Um, now, at the same time, we've also seen a huge change in the market for the currency itself. In the past, there were two distinct markets, with the first one onshore in China being called the, the CNY market. This was effectively inaccessible to foreigners. It meant that when you wanted to send funds into China, you sent US dollars, uh, which were then inefficiently converted into domestic currency for payment. Um, and at the same time, we saw the evolution of uh, what we call the non-deliverable forward market. Um, and this was a market in which foreign businesses and investors hedged their costs and their revenues in China. Because there was no true link between the two, it was effectively impossible for a foreign business to effectively manage uh, or to efficiently manage their onshore currency risk. You had to uh, execute a forward contract in the offshore market, uh, take it off, settle in U.S. dollars, and then send U.S. dollars to China. And this meant that there was a lot of broken links uh, uh, throughout the payment process. However, a few years ago, we began to see the rise of a third market, which is known as the CNH, um, the H referring to Hong Kong, which, where it is settled. Trades conducted in CNH are directly deliverable for both Chinese and foreign participants. And this means that both sides can hedge themselves against risk more effectively and move currency more efficiently. Um, now, because of these advantages, it has grown swiftly to the point that it is, it is expected to supersede the non-deliverable forward market within the next two years. I would suspect that eventually there will be no need for the non-deliverable forward market at all. Um, now, the, the key thing to think about here is that the more that participants use CNH, the greater, uh, the, the cheaper uh, transaction costs are becoming, the faster settlement speeds are becoming, and uh, the more attractive the uh, CNH currency code is becoming for corporates that need to move money in and out of China. Um, we've, seen, uh, we've seen improvements in, in settlement speed, uh, cost, et cetera, uh, for corporates that have moved uh, from sending in CNY uh, to sending in CNH over the last couple of years. Um, and thirdly, what we're seeing is a widening in the trading band for the renminbi. As you can see, we've seen larger swings over the past year as perceptions on its future path have shifted. Now, while this looks very dangerous at first glance, uh, and uh, you know we're, we're all afraid of volatility to an extent, it actually offers major trading opportunities to businesses that are prepared to apply the same trading tactics that they use in other currencies. Um, you know, if you use uh, trading tactics to, to uh, manage volatility in the euro, you can now apply many of those same tactics to the, uh, to the renminbi itself. So overall, what we're looking at here is that there are three key advantages. By converting to renminbi payments, businesses can now streamline processes by gaining visibility into their transactions from point to point by eliminating intermediary banks and by being able to control the exchange rate at both ends. Uh, they can also manage risk by using things like deliverable forward contracts to guarantee their exchange rates into the future. And I think this is an extremely important point. Um, my co colleague Alfred Nader uh, led an effort earlier this or earlier last year, I should say, to survey Chinese exporter pricing. Um, and he found that 20% of Chinese firms tack on, on an additional 3% fee to cover themselves against exchange rate risk when they're receiving U.S. dollars. Um, and this can really be utterly eliminated by paying those invoices in renminbi instead. Um, you know, and there's really no harm in asking. So for businesses that are making payments into China, they can save money and strengthen relationships at the same time. Um, and last but not least, as I just mentioned, uh, you know, businesses can harness volatility in the currency. Uh, if it is behaving just like any other major currency, you can apply the same trading strategies to it. Um, in particular, uh, I would want to highlight here market orders that protect your bottom line 
while capturing upside movement. Um, and this can really be used to turn uncertainty into profits. Um, and what am I referring to specifically there? I'm talking about nested market orders, things like stop losses, trailing stop losses, and, uh, and market bids. All of this really adds up to a very, very simple reality. And that is that adopting the renminbi now gives your business a competitive advantage in the future. That's not just my opinion. Um, last year, we saw the renminbi's international usage grow by 14.8% compounded monthly. So the world is figuring this out very, very rapidly. Um, as a matter of fact, we're seeing uh, much more rapid growth in areas like Europe, uh, Australia, etc., cetera, um, than we are seeing in the United States. Um, so it's now time for the United States to seize the opportunities that are being created. Um, which really brings me to the crux of today's se session. Um, experienced market watchers know that investment trends come and go. They create opportunities when they come, but they also create opportunities when they go. Uh, I always like to think of what Warren Buffett says about this. He says that it's only when the tide goes out that you learn who has been swimming naked. Um, sometimes you don't like what, what you see when the tide reverses, and sometimes you do. What's happening in China right now will be very dangerous for the markets in the short term, but very good for the world in the long run. I'd be much, much more worried if it actually wasn't happening. So the key here is to keep looking for attractive opportunities. Um, and you know, with that, I'd like to close by talking about a historical parallel. Around 220 years ago, an English ambassador made several trips across the planet uh, by ship uh, over the seas, bringing more than 600 cases of gifts to the court of the Qin Emperor. He brought things like chronometers, telescopes, a planetarium, and exotic chemicals that had just recently been invented in the West, things that the Chinese had never seen, and that might have been extremely valuable in understanding more about the world and more about the world's place in the universe. So understandably, after all of this effort, he was excited to hear their response. He waited at the imperial court every day for more than six months, and he eventually received a message back. The message said, there is nothing we lack. We have never set much store on strange or ingenious objects, and nor do we need any more of your country's manufacturers. Um, and I think what's key here is that from that time forward until now, the flow of trade and ideas has actually largely remained the same. We've seen a situation where China has changed the world ever more dramatically, and, and certainly ever more dramatically over the last two decades. Um, but what we now need to prepare for is actually the opposite. As policymakers guide the economy in a new direction, as the country rebalances, and as it becomes a true counterpart to the great powers in the rest of the world, it will begin to change. So we need to prepare for the world actually changing China. We need to think about the huge opportunities that will be created in the coming decades as our paths converge. Um, I think that's really the key message. Um, and actually, with that, I'd like to quickly mention that today's session was a very broad overview. Um, we do send out more in-depth research on a continual basis. So please get in touch by emailing our conference organizers today, um, and they will they'll, uh, pass your communication along so that we can add you to our analytical distributions at no cost. Um, and of course, you can also reach me through LinkedIn directly as well. Um, Ernie, did you want to take it from here? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for the great insight. And with that, we're going to open up our Q&A session. Again, um, please enter any of your questions into the questions area in your uh, GoToWebinar um, control panel. And as I mentioned, we might not get to all of your questions, but if we don't get to those, I'm sure Carl will be happy to answer those questions um, on performative. Um, first question um, for Carl. Um, you mentioned that China's uh, rebalancing, and someone's asking the question, how long do you think this rebalancing uh, will, will, will require if it happens? Okay, so I guess the way I would look at that is it's a, an extremely gradual process. Uh, China doesn't do anything suddenly um, for good reason. When you're, when you're uh, talking about the destinies of 1.3 billion people, um, you need to take your time and, and consider things very, very carefully. So what I would expect is that we see incremental changes in areas of the economy over the next 20, 30 years, um, bare minimum. So we're not talking about an overnight phenomena here. Um, and the other, the other fact of the matter is, too, that we've seen this rebalancing really happening for more than a decade going back. Um, we, we knew back in uh, you know, the turn of the century that, that there were some inefficiencies cropping up in the Chinese economy, and uh, policymakers started to take steps toward uh, rectifying those problems. And really, that is what you were seeing uh, looking at the you know, pension coverage. Um, you're seeing it in, in things like health care uh, throughout the Chinese economy. 
you're seeing these adjustments being made. Um, however, uh, when we look at the very nature of China as a large exporting country, um, you know, I think that that's going to change much more quickly. You're going to see uh, other countries improving competitiveness over the next 10 to 15 years, and you'll see growth slowing within China itself. So you're talking about a fairly dramatic process, a fairly quick process in historical terms. Great. Thanks, Carl. Um, I have a lot of questions coming, which is great. Um, can you give us um, any insights into the direction of the renminbi over the next 6 to 12 months and also maybe some key factors that you see that might be driving that volatility or the direction? Sure. Um, great question. So, and, it, and it's interesting right now to look at the renminbi. So what happened, uh, to put some context on it, is that uh, back in approximately August last year, uh, August of 2011, we started to see pessimism growing about China. We started to, to see people believing that the Chinese government would eventually step in to uh, lower the value of the renminbi. So the renminbi actually dr dropped in value for uh, almost nine months before starting to rise again this year. Why has that happened? Because uh, investors, uh, particularly within China, have determined that the Chinese government is fairly committed to, to its path. Um, that it is not uh, it is not interested in uh, stepping in to bolster the economy by dropping the renminbi uh, uh, too dramatically at any time in the near future. Um, however, over the next year, I would expect that uh, we see more volatility um, in, in the sense that uh, expectations will shift several times. Whenever we see a negative uh, set of data being released in China, we see the renminbi uh, fall slightly as investors price in that a possibility that the government may step in to push the currency down. Um, but at the same time, I think in the long run, the currency uh, is positioned to rise. So um, you're seeing, you're seeing you know, brief corrections in, in its path, but you're actually seeing the renminbi, renminbi continue to rise over time. All that being said, the, what's amazing about the situation is that at any given time, um, the forward market is very, very efficient because uh, the perceptions on China's path are so balanced. In other words, we often have a situation, and we certainly have a situation right now, where the market is effectively paying you to hedge your renminbi uh, payments. And that's a phenomenal situation. Um, how long that lasts, hard to say, but I say that you have, uh, you have at least six months to a year while that sort of situation remains in, in uh, place. Um, on top of all that, the one fundamental thing I want to say here is that most Western analysts and, and economists will tell you that the renminbi is far undervalued. I would say it's very, very close to uh, equilibrium right now. Why is that? Because we've all looked at one side of the equation. We've only looked at the exchange rate. We haven't looked at how, many, uh, how much renminbi has actually been print printed over the last uh, 25 years. And it's just been a phenomenal amount of uh, currency. So when we look at uh, you know, the number of units outstanding time, times the uh, exchange rate that's applied to them, we may actually be looking at a currency that's close to fundamental value now. Okay, great. Um, we've got uh, several uh, group of questions. I'll try and uh, get you to knock some of these out. Um, regarding, I'd say, the myth versus reality as far as doing business in renminbi in China, um, our first question is around the fact that it's technically available, but, but um, some people are, are, are understanding that there's certain local, local regulations that, that have you know, not yet made this possible. Do you have a sense um, of that uh, sense of reality? You know, technically it's available, but are you hearing from clients and others that you deal with that this isn't really what it's supposed to be yet? We've uh, we've certainly heard this sort of thing, um, and you know, I think it's a learning curve for um, for businesses on both sides, um, both within uh, China and and in the West. Um, but in general, uh, the the fact of the matter is that. Uh, you know the, the currency is being internationalized. These rules are uh, have been removed uh, in large scale. So any any issues that we've typically run into are more uh, can be more characterized as as technical glitches, not uh, you know fundamental issues with sending renminbi into China. Um, all of that being said, there is uh, there is a differing appetite across China for receiving renminbi. That that's uh, the reality of the situation. For large international businesses that can redeploy U.S. dollars overseas, um, you know they're they're quite content to continue receiving U.S. dollars, and they'll often uh, say so. 
Others, uh, typically smaller enterprises, are much more content to be receiving renminbi, uh, really for two reasons: because you know they can spend within uh, spend those renminbi within China, but also too they are uh, you know they're then positioned for an increase in the value over time. Um, now, all that being said, um, you know I think I think the key here is to simply ask the question. Um, and that is where, and, and again, referring, my, uh, referring to my colleague's uh, research, that is where the linkage has broken down over, the, over time. It's that American businesses have typically n not asked their onshore partners whether they would prefer to receive renminbi and you know, done the work to, uh, to make that uh, sort of transaction happen. If they do, um, you know, we've really definitely seen uh, an improvement in relationships and we've ultimately seen renminbi transactions begin to flow. Yeah, that leads me to another um, interesting uh, question um, slash comment. There's uh, an attendee uh, who's saying that there are many businesses in China that are hesitant to trade um, in, in, in renminbi and, and that they actually think they have to still trade in, in U.S. dollars uh, to export. Do you think there's any um, government influence on that front at all? There was way back, uh, you know, 2005, 2007, um, or and and prior to that, if you were receiving U.S. dollars, um, it was nice and clean because that meant that you were exporting to the outside world, um, and at the time you received tax credits for doing that. However, at this point, um, from what we know, that is not the case any longer. Um, those tax, those rebates apply regardless of which currency you're receiving. So, uh, for a business that's receiving uh, in uh, renminbi they're actually achieving the same gains that they would otherwise while paying less to do the transaction itself, um, you know, which is a hands-down benefit. Um, all that being said, I guess, uh, the, you know, there, there is one caveat on this whole thing, and that is that there's a significant group of uh, Chinese uh, participants who believe that the economy is uh, deteriorating very much as, as uh, you know, we've laid out today. And as a result, there is a strong appetite among many businesses and investors to actually move investment or to move funds offshore. Um, and in those cases, you know, it, it does often serve that business better to receive U.S. dollars. So again, the, the key really is to, uh, to approach it with an open mind and simply you know, ask the question, find out whether they prefer one or the other, and, uh, and work uh, out from that standpoint. Okay, great. Uh do you, do you feel um, that, that companies feel um, that this in the, in the process of the international, internationalization of the renminbi, do you think companies are starting to really um, look at potentials to, uh, like you said, uh, do business in the local currency to start creating um, some natural hedges that might not have been possible before? Do you think we're starting to see that yet? And if, if not, how long do you think that might take for folks to start looking at that? Oh, absolutely no question that we're seeing a huge uh, uptick in, in interest and uh, a huge uptick in, in the amount of strategization going around this. Um, in particular, I'd, I'd definitely highlight situations where you have uh, companies that are, you know, they're based in the United States, however, they have an export market in Europe and they have uh, costs being uh, generated in China. Um, in such a situation, you now have a situation where you can uh, you can book a Euro CNH uh, forward contract that's deliverable into China, and you can lock in those costs. And you're seeing a lot of companies um, taking that that uh, sort of strategy on because it does create a lot of efficiency on the balance sheet, um, and you know it protects the company against risk on both sides over time. Um, and uh, and yeah, you know we're uh, you're seeing more of it even even uh, in the media itself. The media is paying more and more attention to what's happening here and, and starting to recognize that the renminbi is on a you know fairly unstoppable path to becoming one of the largest trading currencies in the world. Okay, great. Well, we'll squeeze in uh, one more question um, in closing. In bringing you know all the great analysis um, to a point, um, in some sense, you know, if if someone is looking at you know. Um, things that are going to impact the Chinese economy, which will in turn impact the global global economic conditions. What are the top um, two or three um, things that people should look for that, that, that would cause the dragon's tail to sway back and forth the most over the next six to 12 months? Sure. Um, very, very good question. So uh, first thing is if the Chinese government decides to step in and, and provide extensive stimulus to the uh, Chinese economy. One of the big uncertainties right now is whether the new generation of leaders will do anything to consolidate their power once they come into power. Um, and there's really two schools of thought here. The one is that uh, 
when they do acquire power that they will be very content to blame any economic weakness on their predecessors. Um, and there's the second school of thought that uh, suggests that you know they're going to take steps to uh, put a floor under the Chinese economy for a period of time. I would be inclined toward the latter, um, and that means that you're going to see situations over the next uh, year where uh, you know things like hard commodity prices continue to weaken. However, they briefly surge upward um, as plans are announced in China. Uh, the second thing that I would uh, look at is housing. Um, you know, very much uh, of the belief that we have a situation in China where housing prices are inflated, uh, that there's too much production going on, uh, too much construction, I should say, and that we have a temp, uh, potential landmine down the road here. If uh, the Chinese government uh, takes steps to stabilize that, um, that's, that's one thing. But if China lets, it, uh, lets the bubble collapse, we could see uh, a dramatic impact in terms of investors trying to move their money out of China um, and the rest of the world downgrading growth expectations. Um, and yeah, the third is that if we do see a revaluation of the renminbi downward uh, for any, any reason, um, that will definitely you know, send uh, shockwaves across the global economy, um, really telling us that, uh, that China is not committed to the rebalancing path. And I'd say on one hand that's, uh, that would be you know, positive for asset prices uh, in the short term, but it would actually be negative for the world's, uh, the global economy's future. Um, you know, a rebalanced China is better for the United States and it's better for the global economy as a whole. Okay, great. Thank you. With that, we'll need to close the Q&A session. Um, again, questions we didn't get to, we'll work with Carl to get those questions and answers up on Performative. I'd like to thank Carl for his time and insight. Again, if you'd like us to connect you directly with Carl, indicate that on the survey. We will invite you to take immediately following the conclusion of the webinar. Carl is clearly a leader in his field and an excellent source of information on today's topics. Thanks again to our sponsor, Western Union Business Solutions. Again, as far as CPE credits are concerned, please send an email to twalsh at performative.com in order to make sure you receive your CPE certificate if you did not register uh, on the way in. And finally, um, I would like to thank the audience um, for their valuable time today. And I'd like to wish everyone um, have, have a great day the rest of the day. And thank you very much. And we very much appreciate your support of Performative. That will conclude today's webinar. Thank you, everyone.